John chapter 20 is where we're going. We've been in a series uh, called I Dare You. And today what we're talking about is I Dare You to Believe. And so this is John chapter 20. This is Easter morning is what this scripture is about right here. This is Easter morning. This is what it says. It's early Sunday morning while it was still dark. Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. So who is that? Who's the other disciple? John. Somebody knows it. Because, you know, the Bible tells us that Jesus said, told John he's the one that he loves. So the other disciple right here is John. So it says, she ran and found Simon Peter and John, who that would be, the one whom Jesus loved. She said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they put him. Understand, at this time, nobody expected the resurrection. Even though Jesus has taught them, even though Jesus has told them that he was going to be resurrected, nobody was expecting it. And so what they believe is that somebody has stolen the body. That Jesus has been put in the tomb and somebody's stolen the body. We'll pick it up at verse number three. It says, Peter and the other disciple, being John, so Peter and John started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter. So John outran Peter. That'd be like me and Cameron racing. If me and Cameron are headed to the tomb, I'll tell you who's going to get there first. I would be the one to come with my tongue hanging out and say, help me, Jesus. <laughs> so it says, so Simon and Peter arrived, and they went inside. Well, I thought, hold on, first number four. They both running, they were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stopped and looked in and saw linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Now this would be kind of strange. If you're thinking that somebody has stolen the body, and you walk up to the tomb, you're like, why in the world did they unwrap him? Why had they just thrown the clothes over here to the side? Why had they unwrapped them? You know, this would be kind of a weird thing that you would be saying, what's going on? Why would somebody steal a body but leave the burial clothes? Verse number six says, Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linens wrap, linen wrapper wrappings lying there. While the clothes, while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrapping. And then the disciple who reached the tomb first went in, and he saw and believed. For until they, before until then, they still hadn't understood the scripture that Jesus must rise from the dead. In today's message title, I dare you to believe. That's what I'm challenging you today. Is I dare you to believe. Matter of fact, that's going to be the most important question you've ever been asked. Is do you believe? Because that question hinges on eternity. If you believe or not. The way you answer that question of yes I believe or no I don't believe. That question hinges on eternity. So I dare you to believe. I dare you to believe in the resurrection. So here's what I want us to do as we talk about Jesus this morning. The first thing I want us to look at is I want us to look at the benefits of believing in Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, I'm going to give you four, maybe five, probably four things of reasons why I could give you 50 reasons why you need to believe in Jesus Christ. But I'm going to give you four. And then the next thing that we're going to do is we are going to look at what does belief mean? Because some of us, we have a different view of what belief actually means. So I'm going to give you four things, 
benefits for believing in Christ, believing in Jesus, and then I'm going to talk about what belief actually looks like. So here's the first thing. If you're taking notes, jot this down. Everything I've ever done wrong is forgiven. If you believe in Jesus Christ, everything that you've ever done wrong is forgiven. Because Jesus Christ, what He did on the cross, dying for your sins, taking the shame, taking the pain, that when He did that, that God is able to forgive you of everything you've ever done wrong. I mean, He's able to give you freely of everything you've done wrong. He's able to give, forgive you completely, not just partially of what you've done, but you're completely, instantly forgiven for everything you've done wrong. Now, here's the great thing about it. It's not only that you've been forgiven freely. It's not only that because you, you can't pay for the price. It's already been paid. It's not only the fact that you've been forgiven totally, but you're also forgiven repeatedly. Because I don't know about you, but I can't keep making the same mistakes over and over. You guys does that way? That you keep making the same things over and over. But, but the good news is that because Jesus died on the cross for us, that we're forgiven repeatedly. For slow learners like me. That it's over and over he forgives us. Even if there was no such thing as heaven, which there is. Don't doubt that. There is a heaven. But if there was no such thing as heaven, this right here to me would be enough. Because I talk to so many people. I've talked to thousands of people. And you know what I find out? That so many people are secretly carrying guilt. So many people are secretly carrying regrets. That you have secret shame that you're holding on to. Or maybe it's, it's you know, the guilt that you're holding on to. And here's the great thing. God forgives all that. Jesus forgives your, sh your shame. Jesus forgives your guilt. He forgives your regrets. You don't have to carry any of that. He says, I forgive you that completely. You've been completely forgiven. Matter of fact, listen to what Acts chapter 10 says. Listen to what Acts chapter 10 says. Everyone who believes in Him will have their sins forgiven through His name. Did you catch that first part of it? Everyone who believes in Him. Not just some people, not certain people, but it says everyone who believes in Him will have their sins forgiven through His name. Romans chapter 3 says this. Romans chapter 3 says, uh, Romans, he says, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes. No, watch this. I love this last part. No matter who we are. He says it doesn't matter who you are. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. Is what it means. And this is true for everyone who believes. It doesn't matter who you are. I love that. See, it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter who you've done it with. It doesn't matter where you did it. It doesn't matter how long you've done it. It doesn't matter any of those things. That you, when, when you believe in Christ, you are saved. He has forgiven you of your sins. Wow. What it literally means is everything is forgiven. That Jesus Christ has forgiven you. So number one is that if you believe that if in Jesus Christ that your sins are forgiven. Number two, another benefit of believing in Jesus Christ is I learn God's purpose for my life. How many of you wonder what your purpose in life is? How many of you go through life and you're like, man, there's got to be more to life than this. I was listening to uh, talk radio. I know that's a shocker to you. But I was listening to talk radio the other day and they were talking about that so many people are looking for a purpose in life. And what they said was that the, that the Muslims are, are and I think in another 20, 25 years that the Muslims are going to be, uh, just there's going to be just as many Muslims as there are Christians. And they said, well, you know, that's no big deal. And for truth, that's not a big deal. But here's the thing. They also brought up ISIS and everything that's going on with ISIS. And they said, this is what they said on talk radio. They said that the reason 
that people are going to ISIS is because they feel like they have a purpose when they go to serve ISIS. Listen, when you become a follower of Jesus Christ, when you believe in Jesus Christ, guess what? I learn God's purpose for my life. So if you're going through life and I don't have a purpose, there's no reason why I'm here. I've got news for you. You can have a purpose because God will show you what that purpose is that he has a plan for you. And so that's the great thing. You don't have to say, I'm going to go sign up for ISIS in order to have a purpose. You can have that purpose. And that purpose is through Jesus Christ. But let me tell you this. You will never know your purpose until you know Jesus Christ. You will go through life wondering and trying to figure out what your purpose is. And you'll never know your true purpose until you know Jesus. Because who created you? Jesus, right? And if Jesus is the creator and he's the one that created you, then he's the one that has a purpose for you. He's put you together. He's created you for a reason. Uh, Colossians chapter 1 verse 6 says this. It says, God created everything in the heavenly realms and in, on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see. Everything created through him and for him is what it says. God created everything. He made it all. Now watch For some reason, this chair just keeps getting brought up in illustrations. But this chair, it was created for a purpose. This chair can't make up its mindset. You know what? I don't want to be used to be sat on. I want to do something totally different. It don't have a choice. This chair was created to... Somebody's booted to sit in it. That's what it was created for. That was the only reason it was created was for somebody to sit in. It don't have a say so. Watch me now. Listen, God created you for a reason. You were created for a very specific reason, and you will never know what that is until you know Him. If you don't know him and you don't have a relationship with him and you're not talking with him, you're never going to fully know what your purpose is. That's how you find out what your purpose is in life. I've heard people say, well, and I've even tried this. I had, this was my own advice that somebody gave me. You just have to look inside. Look inside your heart and, and see what it is you love. And that, that, is, that is what you're created to do. That sounds good. It's partially true, but that's not totally true. Because you have to look to the Creator, the one that created you, to see what you're truly made to do. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, this is the message version. This is what it says. It says, in Christ, it is in Christ that we find out who we are and what we are living for. Part of the overall purpose is working out everything and everyone. It is in Christ that we find out who we are and what we are living for. It's through Christ. So you, you've got to have that. Number three, not only do I, I get to be forgiven, not only do I get to have a purpose and find out what that purpose is, I get God's strength for my daily life. I get God's strength for my daily life. And I used to think this was no big deal. When I was 20, at 16, 18, I didn't, you know, I was like, I don't need God's strength. I've got plenty of strength. I've got plenty of energy. I'm ready to go. Now I'm 44, drinking and sure. <laughs> you know, here, here's a, just a thought for you. Uh, my first communion that I did with, at that time it was Cornelia Church of God, instead of giving me grape juice and bread, I told Christy, I said, honey, I said, I hate to say it, but we need to give insure. 
with, with Maria because we got so many so many people that are over 60 that I think it's going to wear them out to get down to the altar. Now I feel like I'm one of those guys. <laughs> I need some insurance just to have the energy. But isn't it great to know that I get God's strength? Because watch. As I said, I used to think it was no big deal. But here's the thing. So many people would say, oh, the biggest problems in life is worry or fear. Or my biggest problems in life are boredom or bitterness. But, but that's not it. I dare to tell you the biggest problems that people are having is weariness. Tired. People are just busy. People are wore out. How many times have you talked to people? I talk to them all the time, and what do they tell you? What do you hear over and over and over all the time? I'm tired. You ever hear people say that? I'm tired, man. I'm wore out. I've been going, 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 and I can't go anymore. I'm wore out. And, and I, you know, I'm sick and tired of being tired. Ever heard that? I am sick and tired of being tired. Hey, how you doing, man? I'm tired. I'm wore out. I've been going. Listen, the reason you're tired is because you were designed for 220 and you've been running on 110. You were designed, you were designed to have 220 volts. Is it volts and a plug -in? Thank you. You can tell what I know. I got my I got my construction down. But it's like you were designed to have to run off 220 volts, but you've only been running off 110 volts. And so you're finding yourself tired. You're finding yourself weary. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like a toaster. A toaster is not any good if it's not plugged up, is it? I trust me, I know, because Christy's got this thing where she doesn't leave any appliance plugged up. She unplugs everything. She, she has this afraid that if we leave it plugged up, it's going to burn the house down. So she doesn't leave me anything. And there's been more than once I've gone to the toaster and I've popped my bread in and I've hit the button. Come back five minutes later and guess what? Nothing. <laughs> Not a single cotton picking thing. I have to plug it in. But when I plug it in, all of a sudden it's connected to a power. And as it's connected to that power, it, it, the, the heat starts to generate and it toasts the bread. And I'm not even going to go into all that. I started to get all excited. I thought I was on Food Network channel. But anyways, the same thing with a blender. A blender's not going to do you any good. You can't chop up ice in a blender. You can't make a smoothie over the cafe shop without a blender, can you? And it's got to be plugged in. You can, if it's not plugged in, you can hit power and nothing's going to happen. Listen, the same thing is true with us. For so many of us, we look like we've got it together. We look like we, we've connected with the power. We're running around. We're tired. We're weary. We're not making any difference. The reason you're tired, the reason you're weary, the reason you're not making any difference is because you're not plugged into the power. You're not connected. And you're trying to do it all on your own strength, own ability, and you're running off 110 volts, and you're designed to run off 220. He's like, man, why can't I make a difference? Why can't I do these things? Because you're not connected. But you see, the great thing is, the benefit of believing in Jesus and having that relationship with Jesus is that you get connected to the source. You get connected to the 220 volts, which all of a sudden, it's like, ooh, I got a jolt in me. I got the power. I, I picture, what, listen, what I picture is that, that dead person that some of us, that's what we're, we are. We're, we're walking dead people because we're not connected to the power. Isaiah said it like this. Isaiah said, verse number four, four, chapter 40, verse 29 says, He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Is what he said. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19 says, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in Him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated Him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. 
come out. Did you get that? This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. I told you, I picture it as a dead person. Some of you guys, you're just walking zombies. You know that. You're not connected. You're going through the motions and you're wanting to make a difference. And you're saying there's got to be more. Well, the problem is you're not, you don't have that connection. And this is one of the great benefits of believing in God is that you have this connection with them and gives you the power. And I, I, I picture, you've seen the movies, but they rub those little shockers together. Clear, boom. Shocks that old chest up. And it goes back down, clear, boom. And they keep doing it over and over. But then nothing happens. But when Jesus says clear, and Jesus, or God says clear, Jesus is in the tomb, God says clear, puts his hands on, boom. Heart starts beating. Jesus is alive. He's able to walk out of that tomb. And for you guys, the benefit of knowing God and believing Jesus is when you say, Jesus, I believe, he says, touches you. Just the right amount of power to wake you up. Say, whoa! There is more to life. There is a purpose. There is a meaning. Wow! The power that we get from having that relationship with them. See, do you realize what happened that day? That Jesus coming and being born and dying on the cross, boom, it split time. Do you realize your birthday is based on this? This is how powerful this moment was. That because of this, that everything, time changed. Everything before this was counted B.C. It was counting up to the birth of Christ. Everything's headed that way. Now all of a sudden, boom, Jesus comes. He dies on the cross. He's resurrected. Everything changes and time changes even even time changes where it's no longer counting up. It starts off at one. Whoops. Jesus is here. Boom. One, two, three. Your birth is based on what we're celebrating today. That's the kind of power we're talking about. So why do you need this power? You know, why do I need it? You need God's power to change the things you can't change. You've got some things in your life that you can't change. You've got some things, I bet you, I know I do, I've got some things in my life that I just don't like about me. I can't change them. But through the power of God, I can. Maybe it's part of your personality that you don't like. And you can't change it, but through the power of God, you can. You can't change your past. There's things that you can't change your, back, your past. There's things you can't handle in life. But through the power of God, you can handle it. You see, that's why you need God's power. That's why you need His strength. You see, when you mess up, you need that power, don't you? And I have messed up, God. When, when you feel like you're a failure, God, I just feel like I'm a failure. God, I just, I want to throw in the towel. I surrender, God. I quit. Isn't that the time you need God's power? How many of us that we knew, man, were, were on the verge? Maybe you're in here today, and you're on the verge of suicide. Maybe you're in that place where you're coming I, I, I'm just a mess up. I'm just a screw up. I can't do nothing right. And I'm ready to throw in the towel. I'm ready to quit. I want to tell you something. You're not a mess up. You're not a screw up. And it's not time for you to throw in the towel. 
that God has made you. He has a plan for you. He has a purpose for you. And through God's strength, through God's power, you can get through what you're going through and you can find your purpose through believing in Jesus Christ and you'll be able to make it one day and you'll be able to look back and this will be a testimony that you'll be able to share with somebody else. And let me tell you, I've been where you were at. I was on the brink of suicide. I was on the line where I was about to step across, but I found the power of Jesus Christ because he died on the cross and through that power, I was able to carry on and get past it and I'm making a difference now Would you be able to tell somebody. All because of the power. That's why you need it. That's why you need God's power. Don't throw in the towel. Continue to hang on with his strength. Philippians 4.13, most of us know it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Let me give you a different version of it, though. A different translation says, I have the strength to face all conditions. By the power of Christ that Christ gives me. I have the strength to face all conditions by the power that Christ gives me. Listen, we're not talking about positive thinking. That's not what I'm talking to you about. Where you're like, oh man, I can think that. I'm not talking to you about, man, you just need to reach down, pull up your bootstraps and go. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is the power of Christ is what I'm talking to you about. Something that's stronger, that can handle all conditions. What kind of conditions are you talking about? I'm talking about loneliness. That when you feel like you're all alone, you're not all alone. You can face that condition of loneliness when you're all by yourself. I'm talking about pressures. Whether when you're at work, whether you're at school, whatever it is that you're in, and you feel so much pressure on you that you want to give up, that's what I'm talking about. That you can, you have the ability to be able to face that pressure. Maybe it's in a relationship where you're in a relationship and you feel like that relationship is so heavy and so so much pressure on you that you want to give up. But through God's strength, that you have the ability to face that. That's what I'm talking to you about. That kind of strength. The stress that you're dealing with, the guilt, the fear, the shame, the boredom, the bitterness. That you're able to face all conditions, all of these things, not just some of them, all of them. That's what you're able to do. I mean, here's three things right here that I've given you that men are like, this is enough right here. We can stop and go home. But the fourth one, which to me is like just shut the front door, let's stop, let's go home, it's good. And that is, I'm guaranteed eternal life. That through Jesus Christ, I am guaranteed eternal life. When Jesus Christ died on that cross, and I believe in Him, and I've accepted Him, I'm guaranteed eternal life. You see, the resurrection proves several things for us. First thing that the resurrection, resurrection proves is that Jesus is exactly who he claimed to be. He is exactly who he claimed to be. Now listen, a lot of people go, oh, I don't believe that Jesus is God, but I, I believe that Jesus was a good teacher. Jesus was a great teacher. No, he wasn't. You can't be claim to be God and not be God and be a great teacher. Okay? Let me put it to you like this. Let's say, I'm up here. My name's Jason. Jason Thorne, in case you don't know. And I'm a good teacher. And some of you could say, okay. I believe that. I believe his name's Jason. I believe he's a good teacher. I'm about that. <laughs> or I can stand up here and I say, hey, my name's Jason Thorne. And I'm a prophet of God. And you must, okay, uh, I'm about that. Maybe, okay. But if I stand up here and I tell you, my name is Jason Thornton, and I'm God. At that point, you have to make a decision, don't you? You have to make a decision. I'm going to believe him. Or I'm not. It's going to change our relationship, isn't it? 
Because I mean, that man's crazy. He thinks he's God. I ain't speaking to him. Get me out of here. I'm gone. Some of you have to make that decision. If I was to stand up here and I was to tell you that you would be faced with a decision to make right now that yes, I believe him, that he is God, or that dude's a lunatic. He's a liar. He's crazy. He's manipulating. He's the greatest con man I ever seen in my life. Y'all would have to make that decision, wouldn't you? Well, listen, this is what Jesus stood up and said. Jesus stood up and he said, hey guys, I'm God. And people had to make a decision. Yes, that is God. Or he's a lunatic. He's a liar. He's a thief. They had to make that decision. But he's exactly who he says he is. He's exactly who he claimed to be. And throughout history, there were thousands of people that claimed to be God. But none of them did it the way he did. Because this is what Jesus said. Jesus says, I'm God. And I'm going to let them kill me. I'm going to let them hang me on the cross. I'm going to let them put me in a tomb. And then I'm going to come back to life. And guess what? Ain't nobody else said that. Ain't nobody else said, ah, go ahead, kill me. Put me in a tomb. I'll come back to life. But Jesus said, I'm going to let them do these things. And I'm going to come back to life. That's the reason we celebrate Easter. Because he let them kill him. He let them put him on the cross. He let them put them in a tomb. And then he came back to life. Not only did he come back to life, guess what? He walked around for 40 days. Can you imagine that? That think about it, didn't you? I'm one of the Roman soldiers that killed him. I'm one of the Roman soldiers that put him on the cross. I'm walking down the streets of Jerusalem one day and looked up and I'm like, oh, wait a minute. That's that man I hung on the cross. That's that man I put a spear in. That's that man I killed. He's back alive. How did this happen? Can you imagine it? For 40 days he walked around. He was shaking people's hands. He was meeting people. One time it says that he had a party with 500 people. It's kind of, it's kind of hard to debate that, isn't it? 500 people hanging around. Hey, let's have a party. Why do you think in Acts that so many people were ready to receive Christ? Because they seen this man killed that claimed to be God and they saw him for 40 days walking the streets of Jerusalem, going to parties, talking to people so they knew that he was God. It's well documented. You can go back and find it anywhere. That he is God. He is alive. And he is well. So the great thing is that we're promised this. And here's the thing. Jesus keeps his promises. See, he told them that this is what I'm going to do, guys. I promise you, I'm coming back. He kept his promise. He died. He came back. He kept his promises. He didn't break them. So the good news is this. Whatever he's promised you, He'll keep his promise. If he's made a promise to you, he says that if you believe in me and you trust in me, that you'll have eternal life. You can hold on to the knowledge truth. He can't he keeps his promises. Third thing it teaches us that there's an afterlife. That when you die, you, you don't just go and be buried in the ground and the worms eat you and that's it. But it teaches us there's an afterlife. There's an eternal life after this. That's what it teaches us. He's, matter of fact, you, most of us know John 3.16. For God so loved the world, He gave His only Son, that whoever shall believe in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That we, there is an after world. There's something that takes place after death. John 11, chapter 11, verse 25, 26 says, Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Buddha never said that. Buddha never said I'm the resurrection and the life. Muhammad never said that. Only Jesus. And this is what he says. He says Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. 
Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. That's what it says. If Jesus Christ had not risen, this verse would be a joke. If Jesus would have died and would have never risen, this verse would be a joke. But he did. It's well documented as well. Jesus died, he was risen, and he came back alive. If he didn't, we might as well go home. But guess what? He did. He came back alive. So, four things, four benefits right here that we looked at. Everything you've ever done wrong is forgiven. Doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter what you've done. Number two, you have a purpose for living. You have a reason for living. Number three, you have a home in heaven. And number four, the power of living here on this earth. You get the power of living here on this earth. So here's a question. He says, everyone who believes. Now this is where I'm going to get some of you. Okay? So let's look at you very carefully. Some of you will miss heaven by 18 inches. Some of you will miss heaven by 18 inches because you have it here, but you don't have it here. You have the head knowledge. You believe, but you don't have it here. You talk, I've talked to people, maybe you talk to people in this, you're going to heaven. And you say, oh, really? How do you know you're going to heaven? Because I believe. I believe there's Jesus. But here's the problem. Satan believed there was Jesus. Matter of fact, Satan believed it so much, he tried to kill him. He tried to destroy him. So are you following me? It's not enough just to say, I believe it. It's not enough just to say, hey, you know, I believe that there's a that there's a Jesus. That's not enough. Even the devil believed that. John chapter 2, James chapter 2, verse 19 says this. Do you think it's enough to believe there is one God? Even the demons believe that. And tremble. So you're not going to find, but we're not going to find these demons in heaven, are we? We're not going to find Satan in heaven, are we? So just because you say, I believe, does not mean that you're going to be there. You see, when the Bible talks about this, this word believe, this word belief is a different word, a different meaning. Let me put it that way, it's a different meaning. That word, that word belief in the Greek, that word, this is what it literally means. It means to trust, to cling, to rely on, to commit to. That's what that word means in the Greek. When you look at that word belief, he's saying, it's not just, I believe it. Because that's what so many of us are saying. I believe that there is a Jesus. I believe there's a God. But are you clinging to him? Are you trusting in him? Are you saying, man, you know, I've got to have him. You see, there's a difference between knowledge. There's different levels of knowledge, right? That's just like, I know the Kardashians. Any y'all know them? One of us, a couple of us, we know them, don't we? We go on TV and watch them. You know, I know a little bit, they have black hair. A little wild, a little crazy. But do I really know the Kardashians? I know of them. I know Tom Cruise. Believe it or not, back when I was in high school, somebody told me I look like him. I'm not going to tell you who they tell me I look like now, but back 20 years ago, somebody said, man, you look like Tom Cruise. <laughs> oh, that was something, man. Talk that old chest out, walk around. Chick. <laughs> yeah, man. Somebody told me what I looked like the other day. <laughs> so I know Tom Cruise, but I really don't know. 
But let me tell you something I do know. Is I do know my wife, Christy. I know her inside and out. I know what she likes. I know what she doesn't like. I know what push, buttons to push when I want to make her mad. And I know what buttons to push when I want to make her happy. I know where exactly on that foot where to hit and make when she wants a massage to make her say, stop, just stop. I don't want to, just don't touch my feet no more. I know everything about her. I know what she likes to eat. Matter of fact, we've been together for more than half her life. I know every detail about her. I even know the gray hair she has. We count her every morning. She's shaking her head. She don't want y'all to know that. But I know them. That's what I'm talking about, knowing Jesus. Do you know Jesus like that? Not where I believe. I believe in Jesus. But do you know him? Do you really have that knowledge of knowing him? That's what I'm talking about. Because Jesus didn't come and die on a cross just so you would believe that there was a Jesus. Instead, Jesus came and died on the cross so that you could know him. And you would have a knowledge of him, have a relationship with him. <coughs> Me and Christy, we have a relationship. We talk. We fellowship. Do you have that knowledge and really have that relationship with I gave you four benefits. I could have given you 50. But I've given you four benefits of having a relationship with the Lord. Of knowing Him. Of having that real knowledge. And so that's my question to you this morning. Is do you have that knowledge of who He is? Will you know Him? Let's bow our heads. Father, Jesus, you came to this.